Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Good. Uh, welcome, everyone. I am Tom Kenworthy, Superintendent of Schools in Portsmouth, and I want to welcome everybody to uh, this collaborative effort among all the East Bay districts. We are very pleased to have uh, Dr. Aaron Bromage with us today. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Colleen Germain, Superintendent of Schools in Newport, and she is going to kind of help uh, moderate uh, today's session with Dr. Bromage. So just so everybody knows, uh, the logistics of how these are going to work. Anyone who signed up uh, saying that they wanted to participate on Zoom, uh, you should be all of the people in the session right now. Uh, in addition, we are simultaneously live streaming on our Portsmouth YouTube channel, and the session will be recorded uh, if people want to go back and view at a later time. So uh, Colleen ha also has the uh, questions that people submitted ahead of time if they choose to do that. Uh, and we are going to have the chat feature enabled today. So I will monitor the chat as we go along. If you wanted to put additional questions in, uh, I will uh, kind of share those if time permits. So I will turn things over to Dr. Colleen Germain at this point. Thank you, Dr. Kenworthy. Thank you, Tom. Um, everyone, um, welcome uh, to this collaborative effort of all the eight East Bay districts, um, trying to help support all of you as uh, teachers, instructors in our buildings. Um, we know that these are very challenging times for everyone and we're all very excited to get back to school. But we also know there's a lot of questions going on about you know, what's safe, what's not safe, what does my classroom need to look like? How do I talk to my kids? Um, so many questions and all the East Bay districts, superintendents, and fortunately for us, the very generous Dr. Bramage is all here to try to support you and help you. He is a professor at UMass. Uh, his resume is very long. I'm not gonna get into it, but I've seen him on CNN all over the place. He's literally a global, almost a global consultant for so many school districts. So I am gonna hand it off to Dr. Bramage and I wanna thank you very much. I just feel we're so fortunate to have you here to be able to talk to our teachers and help answer those very important questions for them. And I wanna thank the Portsmouth School Department for hosting today's session. So Dr. Bramage, it's all up to you. Thanks, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, it is great to be here. Um, I know this, this is a really scary and uncertain time, but I'm hoping that um, with this forum, you have the opportunity just to be able to ask questions and get what I hope are straight answers out of this. I really have no agenda when it comes to um, any of this other than people's safety. And my primary focus really in the last six weeks has been teacher safety because everybody has focused their attention on do kids get sick, do kids get infected, um, and everybody sort of forgot about the teachers and that without the teachers being in the classroom or the teachers being healthy, we really don't have school, we have daycare. And we don't want that. We want to be able to be doing our job as educators. So um, it's going to take me a little while to get my brain into gear because I literally just got off teaching. So I've just taught my class of 60 people via Zoom and it was all on infections and disease and fun things like that. So I've got to jump brain a little bit now to working with K through five people and thinking about their side of things. Um, a little bit about me first. Um, I am a professor of immunology and infectious disease. Um, I've been in this field, in this space for about 25 years. I work on zoonotic pathogens, so pathogens that jump from animals to humans, just like this bug has from bats to humans, as well as from humans back to animals. Um, I work in areas of vaccine design, um, disease diagnosis, you know, using diagnostic tools. Um, uh, you know, we work on uh, exposure systems. We basically work out how to keep animals and humans safe in my lab. Um, I work with some pretty nasty bugs. Uh, my lab, when it was up and running, it's closed down now, just like schools and everything were, um, had 20 to 25 people in there working on these things. And I can say I've kept my people safe for the last 25 years from pathogens that want to use you as a food source and animals that want to bite you and give you that pathogen so they get their own back on you. 
But prior to actually working in academics, um, I worked in construction, engineering, um, hospitality. So I had a lot of a background in physical building infrastructure and systems. And where that sort of put me into a sort of a unique place is I understand both the biology of how infections occur. Um, I understand how they occur, but I also understand methods by which we can adapt our environment, adapt our behavior, um, just change the things around us to make um, it safer from an infection control purpose. And so since I've sort of been thrown in the spotlight of this, I really did not have a focus on schools other than my kids' school right at the start, starting to work with them. Um, but I ended up working with, um, I'm doing about a quarter, a little over a quarter of the states in this country um, doing their um, courts. I'm getting their federal and their state courts open so that we can have jury trials, um, grand jury trials, essentially putting 40 people into an enclosed space for multiple days and trying to keep everybody safe. Um, and then in addition to that, I've found that there is a group of people that make movies that really need help on how to get um, actors and actresses together unmasked and not have infections move through. So I'm now working with 10 different movie and television shows, um, meeting some amazing people, but really helping them design systems by which um, they can come to work. Uh, and this is everyone from the construction through to the costumers and hair and makeup um, through to the actors, but they can come to work and feel safe in their work environment, knowing that infections are not going to occur. Um, and then I sort of started working with my local schools about three months ago, um, been doing a lot of the Southeast region of Massachusetts and then for, I don't, not really quite sure how it happened, the governor of Rhode Island reached out and said, can you help? And I went, ah, yeah, maybe. And I've started to help as much as I can with the governor of Rhode Island and with RIDE and with the Department of Health, just trying to get them thinking practically about the risks that we have in school environments, how to make it safer for not only the students, but the teachers and what our new world needs to look like to keep everybody safe. So before I open up to questions, I just want to go back to the fundamental basics of infection, especially with this pathogen. Um, there are three main ways to get infected. The first and the simplest is face-to-face -face conversations with a person who is infected when you're closer than about six feet. As I'm speaking, I have these little droplets that come out of my mouth, travel from my mouth and follow a ballistic trajectory. They come out and then they drop down. Um, those droplets, if I am talking to somebody and they're close enough, will hit their eyes, hit their nose, hit their mouth. And I'm not talking big spit droplets like we always have when somebody sprays. I'm talking droplets that you really don't see. Um, the easiest way to see them is on a winter's day when you go outside and you can see your breath. It's those type of droplets. But being in a face-to-face -face conversation with a person that is infected can lead to those droplets hitting your eyes, your nose, and your mouth and results in infection in as few as a few minutes. We tend to think of it being 10 to 15, but if enough of them hit you, you can be infected very quickly. So the absolute simplest way to defend yourself against infection from those respiratory droplets is what I'm seeing on a number of you now, which is masks. Masks will catch those droplets right at the source and never allow them to get out. This is where you hear about masks and masks, my mask protects you, your mask protects me, is because they do, and even the most basic mask will capture 100% of those droplets leaving a person's mouth so they can never hit your eyes, your nose, or your mouth. But we also want to add an extra layer of defense rather than just masks. And that extra layer of defense is distance. If we can get six feet away, we know that even if that mask fails, so if it would drop down or they rip it off quickly, if you've got that six feet of distance, none of those large droplets will land in your eyes, your nose and your mouth. So now we have those two layers of defense against that particular way of being infected. The other way of getting infected is through aerosolized virus. So you might've heard it saying airborne or aerosolized, 
there is a little bit of a fight happening in academics about this, but everyone does agree that the really small droplets that come out of our mouth do contain virus and they can travel at least six feet but there has been publications that show they go at least, they can go up to 24 feet away from a person. Now, what do these droplets look like and why doesn't the mask take care of them? If you're wearing a mask and you have glasses on and you're breathing and your glasses fog up, they're the droplets now that we're worried about. They're the much lighter ones, the ones that don't travel ballistic trajectory. They come out and they'll come out the side of your mask, underneath your mask or up through your mask. And they come out into an air, into a little bit of a cloud around you. And again, if you're talking to a person, they can travel six feet to that person. And rather than landing on your eyes, nose and mouth, they get inhaled and they get inhaled and they go down into your lungs. And that can establish an infection. So our defenses against that particular mode of infection is once again masks, but now not a handkerchief mask or a gaiter. This is getting onto better masks. So a mask that has wire in it that fits across your nose and stops more of the, um, those droplets getting out is a good mask. A mask made of two, two layers of material is a good mask. Three, even better. Uh, better again, surgical masks. So um, a type one surgical mask is good. A type two is better. A type three, better again. Now you might have heard of N95s or KN95s. They can be better than a type three, but only if they fit properly and they don't have gaps in them. And it takes quite a bit of testing to make sure you've got the right one. But a, a good mask being worn on a person will capture the majority of those aerosols going out and importantly, it will stop them from coming in as well. Um, my judgment on a good mask is a mask that when you breathe, it comes out. And when you breathe, it folds in. That way, we know most of the air is passing through the material, not through the gaps. If you find that your mask is just holding and sticking out there perfectly, it really means that you're not filtering anything. It's really coming in the gaps of your mask and not providing you protection against those aerosols. But we don't just have to rely on masks for defending ourselves with this one. Um, this is not a five minute infection. This is not a 10 minute infection. Those droplets are smaller. They have less virus in them, which means that you've got to have more of them in order to get infected. And it usually takes half an hour, an hour, two hours for that type of infection to happen. So the way that we combat this, well, we could cut down time, but more importantly, we increase ventilation or we increase filtration of the spaces in which we are in. If those things never build up, if they're extracted from the room that we're in, they don't present a risk to anybody. If those things are filtered through a system that take those aerosols out of the air, they can't infect anybody. So it may seem really like a low tech approach to um, defense of your classroom, um, but the defense for this one is literally opening a window. When you open a window, you ventilate your space. Now, the only reason I don't like just saying opening a window is that means we're dependent on the amount of air coming in that window and therefore the weather. And this is where I love the whole approach of just grabbing a box fan or an exhaust fan and putting it in the window and sucking the air of the classroom out and blowing it outside. In a typical classroom of about 20 feet by 30 feet, a single $25 box fan from Walmart will turn over the air in that classroom somewhere between 10 and 15 times per hour. That means you are not rebreathing any air that has come out of another person. That means the virus cannot build up in the air and that makes that classroom air safe. Um, and so what we're literally trying to do is work out ways with ventilation to create a safer atmosphere. Now in your classrooms, you might have univents in the wall. Those univents, if they can be opened up to bring in outside air, are just as good as having a window open. But you've got to know that they're actually bringing in outside air. If you've got windows, open them. If you've got a door, open them. If you can create a cross breeze, do it. 
because we want the air inside that classroom to get out of that classroom. Now, if we can't get ventilation, we work on air filtration. So in some schools, they have a central HVAC system. And I say some, uh, only about 10, 15% of the schools that I've been into actually have an HVAC system, an HVAC system that can really do a decent job in stripping the virus out of the air. Um, they need to have um, a filter in them called a MERV-13, so an M-E-R-V-13 uh, filter. If you've got that in your HVAC system, every time it circulates your classroom over, it can strip those aerosolized viruses out of the air and make the room safer. Um, no school will have HEPA filters in their system. You're looking for MERV 13, 14, 15 or higher. 13 is where you want to be with that. Um, some of the HVAC systems can also be bringing in a lot of outside air as well. They have an opportunity to bring it in and mix it inside. Um, so where we have the opportunity to do that, we put in MERV 13 filters and increase the amount of outside air. The goal that we're trying to get to with filtering or with ventilation is four air changes per hour of your space. So how do I work that out? Work out the length of your room, the width of your room. So now you've got the square feet, how high is your ceiling? And that will give you cubic feet of your classroom. Okay, it's a really easy calculation. If I've got a classroom that is, let's just say 10,000 cubic feet, that would be enormous, but a 10,000 cubic foot classroom. And I put a box fan in the window, um, a box fan on high does 2000 cubic feet per minute. Okay, so every 10 minutes, the entire volume of my classroom is now out the door, okay, or out the window. So that means six times in an hour, the entire air volume of my classroom has been sent outside. That is the goal of what we're after. Four is the minimum, six is the optimum. If we get 20, great. But we're really aiming for a minimum of four and preferably six. If we can't get to four, we need to look at taking students out of the classroom and lowering the number of them down. So there's a balance that goes there. But for me, a safe classroom, and when I say this for me, uh, my kids started school yesterday. Um, when I walked into my kid's school and saw exhaust fans in every single window, I saw space between the desks. I was a happy dad, knowing that what they had focused on was ventilation and distance and masks, knowing that my kids were going to be safe from those two modes of infection. The last way to get infected is from contaminated surfaces. And every school that I've worked in has focused way too much on contaminated surfaces. Surfaces at the most account for about 5% of all infections. All other infections happen through those first two ones that I talked about. Now that doesn't mean that we need to discount um, that surfaces are not important. It just means that we shouldn't be spending 50% of our school budget, of our COVID budget on cleaning surfaces. We want to identify high touch surfaces. So door handles to bathrooms, to classrooms, things, doors where people have to touch and open, hand railings where everybody puts their hands, or high contact surfaces in classrooms where lots of people touch. Yes, we want to clean those more often. But the thought of having a custodial person walking around the school and spraying, the thought of deep cleaning a classroom every day um, is, it may seem great, but it's really pandemic theater. It's really not about protection. It's about showing that we care, but not really about controlling the infection. So we should clean and we should clean a little bit more, but there is no reason to have people walking around cleaning every surface every hour of the day when we could be spending that money on better air filtration for the school or maintaining different distance or getting a good mask on every single teacher that's there or every student that's in that space. That's where we wanna be spending our time and our money. So I will stop now and I will open it up to questions and we'll just go from there. Okay, um, thank you very much, Dr. Ramaj. Um, and thank you for the math equation that we'll all have to work on length times width times height to get cubic feet. So everyone will work on that to, to check that airflow. Um, let me get to the questions for you. 
Sure. Um, the first one is ther therapists see six groups a day. How does going into six different stable pods affect both the student and staff safety? Right. So one of the best things that we can do and most schools have done is create these pods, these stable pods where the kids are stable and the teachers that are in there are stable. So some schools have been able to do it with a single classroom and a single teacher. Um, others have had to do it at a grade level where the teachers move between all the third grade classes because of specialities that they have, but they've made the pods that entire class, like that entire grade. So depending on the safest is the smallest, um, just because there's fewer exposures. But in all school environments, and for that matter, in all work environments, there are these highly mobile people that I won't say destroy the integrity of the pods, but do put a problem when we're looking at pod integrity. And the problem is, is if we have a highly mobile teacher um, that is, uh, actually I'll share the screen and sort of draw it to you. Um, hopefully this comes up, okay. So if we have, uh, go away. I promise this was working this morning. Ah, it's not going to work for me right now. Um, I will come back. If we have a, a system by which we have uh, pods, so each of these classrooms are a pod, and we have somebody going into each of those classrooms, what ends up happening is if that person ends up being infected, I'm talking about that teacher that's going into each of the classroom ends up being infected. Um, if we're being as cautious as possible, every single one of those pods needs to quarantine because of the movement of that particular teacher. So um, because it would be really hard to identify who had close contact with that teacher in that space. So the next best step that we have in there is if a teacher is going into a pod, then there should be a space in that room that is physically separated away from everybody else in that classroom. So we know it's not just six feet. We know that it's 10 feet. And then that teacher can work with that one single student and know that there was no interactions or no way that there could be interactions with these other kids in that particular classroom. So if that teacher was then to test positive later, the only person that would need to quarantine is the student that they interacted with. So that's one level that you can put in there. My preference is we don't even go to trying to engineer that. My preference is that the student comes out of the classroom and meets with the, the teacher in a different space. And I know that won't be as efficient and it may not be as secure, but the logic is if we can put a, a teacher into a single space and create the exact environment that that teacher needs to um, do their job most efficiently, but also most safely. So we may have a room that, you know, we have a window, we have an exhaust fan in, and we set it up for the students to come there. I think of things like speech therapy, where I can set it up with a barrier and I can have a, a window unit drawing the air out and blowing it out, or a HEPA filter set in that space. The student can come to that space. So the interaction is done safely. But then again, the only interaction that occurs is between the student and teacher, and you can be 100% certain that that's happened. So now the pod integrity is not disrupted. If the teacher tests positive, only the student they met with or the students they met with need to be quarantined. If one of the students tests positive, only that teacher needs to quarantine, not the teacher's secondary contacts. So what we sort of tend to think about is how is the system or what system can we develop that may not be as efficient as what you've done in the past, but is more robust when it comes to what happens if that teacher tests positive. The impact could be enormous if they go to six different classrooms, but if the classroom or the person from that classroom comes to them, the impact may now only be six students. So six classrooms versus six students, I will take the inefficiencies of having the student come to me 
than the disruption of six classrooms going down. And it could be the teacher comes to the door and knocks on the classroom, meets the student and walks them there. We just need to have an understanding that where you might have been able to see 10 students in a day, it's now going to be six. But it's going to be six done safely and we maintain the integrity of the school. Okay. Uh, another question is, what are some things teachers can do to maximize air quality in classrooms and buildings? Yeah, so I will give you my approach for what I did for my classroom. I have a 50-foot extension cord and two box fans. And when I go to class, I run the extension cord. We don't have uh, power outlets very close in my classroom. I plug in the extension cord. I put the two box fans at an outdoor door that I have going out into the quad and I turn them on. And then I open the door to the hallway inside the building and I create a wind tunnel. And the wind just gets drawn in and gets blown out and I've now created a safe air environment. I have also, I, I'm a very mobile teacher. I like moving around. I will, when a student sort of drowsies off a little bit, I'll come and sit next to them, embarrass them a little bit. Um, I'll walk up to them and we'll have conversations. I've had to change how I teach. I teach from the front of the classroom now. Um, if I am talking up there, I am now, I am distanced from my students. Um, I am providing safety to both myself and my students by teaching to the front, from the front. Um, when I need to have, and I realize this is different if you're in a KE classroom and things like that, but um, the interactions that I'm now having with students are not me walking to them. It is them walking to me. I have set it up so that when I want to have an interaction with somebody, I have designed it. And so think of this with your desk at the front of the classroom. Um, I put a spot on the floor where a student that wants my help will walk up and stand. And then I will be six feet away. And I know it sounds incredibly impersonal, but it means that if I walk down through that classroom, I am potentially having all these interactions with kids, which puts me at greater risk. Um, they could stop and talk to me. The mask could come down. Any of those things could happen. Whereas if they come to me, I know my interaction is one-on-one -on -one and I can control it with distance and masks. Um, so classrooms, when we're designing them, we really need to design them with the teacher safety in mind. Um, I like the whole idea of having a buffer in front of the classroom where students are back a little bit further from me. I like a buffer around my desk where students are back, you know, away from me. And then if I want to sit up there in the front of the class and teach, I know that there's at least six feet, preferably further between me and the first student that I know I have my safe space to work in. Um, a box fan works great. Uh, knowing your HVAC system. So ask your school what your HVAC system looks like if that's what you're relying on. Um, that can work as well. And then in one of the school districts that I worked with, and sorry to drop people in on this that aren't responsible for budgets, one of the school districts, they knew they didn't have the access to windows that they needed. So they literally bought a per portable HEPA filter for every single classroom. And we put them in the middle of every classroom and we got them and bought them at a level so that we knew that they would turn the classroom air over four times per hour. That way they knew if they needed to close up the windows, that way if the HVAC system didn't work, they knew they actually had protection on a bench right next to them. Um, I will say in that particular case, the, I'm gonna get the thing wrong, Parent Teacher Association, the, the parents association, they paid for half of these and then the school district paid the other half. And there is the hope that the federal government with this new um, relief effort coming in may actually pick up the tab and reimburse everybody. But they took that strategy for their classroom. I'm gonna follow up on that because a lot of the schools buildings in our eight districts are older ones that some may not have any kind of HVAC system if the windows are open and we follow the box fans and the fans, is a HEPA filter needed right away? Or is it something we, we should consider for the cold months? Right, so literally the strategy while the weather is great is get your kids outside. Um, I was really excited on the first day of school where they actually, they conducted class outside. And I realize not all schools can do that. So outside is our first thing. But we have about eight weeks now of decent weather. 
a box fan in the window of every classroom. Two, if it's a huge classroom. If you're a science classroom, turn on the fume hoods. Sucks the air out as well. Any way to get the air out or fresh air in, you do. My perfect world in regards to getting a school there is, and I realize we have safety concerns, but open your front doors of the school. So we've got a huge entrance open. I know you can't do it, but find somewhere else that allows a lot of air to come in. You keep the door open to every single classroom and you put a box fan in the window of every classroom facing out so it's blowing the air out. Now, what that does is it draws air in through the front door of the school, down the hallways and out of the classrooms. It ventilates the entire school, including the hallways. If we do it the other way around and we blow air in, the problem in your classroom that gets blown down the hallway. So we don't want that if we can avoid it. If you can't open the doors to your hallway, put a box fan in one window and at the other end, maybe on, obviously on the same wall, open a window at the other end of the class so air can come in. So mechanically ventilate so that it comes around. Um, now in many classrooms, virtually all of them, they do have these univentilator systems in there. We cannot rely on univentilator systems for filtration. They cannot be upgraded to have a filter in them that will provide protection, but they can be adjusted so that they're bringing in outside air. So there's a little economizer, there's a dampener that they can open. If we can, we just have a 100% outside air coming in and they're all being put into schools. They can do six to eight air changes per hour with univentilators. We want it at six with outside air if we possibly can. But if you can open the windows, mechanically ventilate, have univents on, that gets you eight weeks at least before the weather changes, okay? By the time we get to week eight, by the time we get to the stage where we need to close windows, we definitely need to have another strategy in place, which is a way to filter the air um, if we have to close up the building. Uh, so now what are the concerns for, another question is, what are the concerns for air quality in rooms with air conditioners? What precautions should be taken? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so the, I won't say the worst case scenario. If you've got an air conditioner, like a portable, you know, in-window air conditioner, um, if there is no filtration in that space and you keep the windows closed so you can keep the cool air in, you are providing um, no value for protection and you may actually be doing a detriment to the protection of yourself and the people in that space. Um, and an unventilated, unfiltered space because window, like window air conditioner units, split system units have zero filtration from a viral perspective. So what you end up doing is creating a, a situation where you're drying the air and moving air around in the classroom, blowing it around essentially, and just moving the virus if it's in that space around and around. And when we see large infections occurring in um, church choirs, in um, Starbucks, they all have the same, the same situation. A space that's enclosed with no windows open and an air conditioner unit that does not filter. Okay, and so this is my problem with having those window units is by themselves, they provide no protection um, and may actually make it a little bit worse. So in classrooms, I realize some people may have um, learning uh, or you know teaching where they have those requirements of needing to have that there. Um, you still need windows open and you still need ventilation, which means that the AC is not really going to be doing what you want it to do. Um, the alternative is have the AC on, but you need then to have portable filtration in that space to do what a window would do for you. So if there was an absolute need for an air conditioner to be in and be on in that same space, if we don't have MERV 13 filters, we must have a HEPA filter in there to provide the protection to the air. Um, I would not, and I don't care what the transmission rate in the community looks like, I would not be in an enclosed classroom that has no ventilation or filtration and a window air conditioner unit does not do that. 
Okay, just to, for clarification purposes, if it's a, a building that's being air conditioned through an HVAC system, yep. are you suggesting that you still need to have a window open? So if you've got a building HVAC system that is, they can be on 0% outside air. So it's pulling in no outside air at all. Um, so then if you've got a system that's doing that, which would be very unusual, you must have MERV 13 filters in them. You must have. If you've got a system that is bringing in outside air, okay, into the HVAC system, um, usually they're set at about 10%. Um, if the person that does the maintenance for your building can open them up wide to 20, 30, 40, 50, 60%, then that is providing the outside air for you and is actually pushing the virus out of your space. Perfect world is as much outside air as we possibly can through the HVAC system and it's going through MERV 13 filters. Um, many high schools I've been into do have that. Um, but it just, it depends on the age of the building and whether they have central air. But the things you're looking for, if it has central air, you want as much outside air as possible. I want to see 20, 30, 40%. And I would love to see um, MERV 13 filters. Um, in a perfect world, one place didn't have the MERV 13s, but they could open the HVAC system to being 100% outside air. And so it was just like having a big box fan, but it conditioned the room. It actually kept it cool or heated and then pushed the virus out. So each system's a little different, um, but I said windows are my favorite out of all of them. Um, but if you've got a fairly new school with an HVAC system, look for outside air and look for um, MERV 13 filters. Okay, the next question is, um well, you may have answered it. I'm interested in the difference between types of filters and cleaning procedures for air filters. Yeah, so if we end up with HEPA filters in the classroom, you really should not have to touch them for a year. Um, put them there, set them up and they go and they run for a year. The only reason why you'd want to change it is if, um, if the outside air became, if we had fires, so like in California, where I've got some of these systems going, we have to change them much more often because HEPA filters will actually pull smoke out of the air. And there's so much smoke there now that it's blocking them up. So we need to change them more frequently. Um, if you're in a dust bowl of a school, um, then and there's a lot of dust coming in, then you might have to change them every six months. But in reality, if you put a HEPA filter in there, um, you've got at least a year before somebody needs to touch it. And when they do this special procedures for it, and I don't suggest that teachers do this at all, um, this should be somebody, I mean, you can do it, but it's just, you need to wear proper PPE. Um, you need to treat it as infected. Um, you open the system up, you take the filter out, you put it into a plastic bag and you dispose of it appropriately. Um, if the school all invests in the same type of HEPA filter, that way the filters you buy and all those things are all the same and a single person can maintain them. But I think for the life of this pandemic, you won't need to change them. Um, if we're looking at school systems, uh, most school systems with MERV 13s would be on probably a six month basis for changing the filters out in the space. Um, I would be going onto a quarterly system rather than a six monthly system. And if, again, the person who's working on those should be aware of the safety precautions they should be taking anyway, even outside of a pandemic with dealing with a MERV 13 filter, um, because its whole job is to track airborne bacteria, viruses and that from the air. So there's a special procedure for that. Um, this should not be something that falls into the domain of a teacher ever. Okay. The next question is, it was how can any school or should a school reopen if the ventilation systems have not been inspected and certified that they are working properly. Yeah, so um, how can we, you know, we can't guarantee, um, but one of, well, I have found that the maintenance people at your school know their system front to back and back to front. Um, they may have univents in them and they may have been designed for 1500 cubic feet per minute of air. They might be down to 12, you know, 1200. Um, if we're working on the margins, then you'd really want to know um, what is going, you know, like what it really is doing. But if you know it's doing 1500 cubic feet per minute, 
Uh, if you know your classroom is 8,000 cubic feet, you know at the best it's turning it over 10, 11 times. At the worst, it's maybe six times. You're still in a good range. But I know that doesn't necessarily work for everybody just to trust. So one of the things that you can do, and I do suggest that you do do, is every school should get hold of a carbon dioxide meter. So a CO2 meter, um, you're looking at about $99 for a basic model, up to a couple of hundred for a decent sort of one. You can get them off Amazon. And if you are uncertain whether the ventilation in your space is appropriate, put that CO2 monitor in there while you have your students in that space. And if you see it getting above 800, the ventilation is not where you want it to be. If it's below 800 parts per million, the ventilation is where you want it to be. Um, it's a really great visual inspection. So um, what we're looking for is atmospheric um, carbon dioxide is 400 parts per million. As people breathe, we put out about 30,000 ppm and that dissipates into the space. So the more people you put into the space, the more carbon dioxide comes out. It's a proxy for the virus. So if we see the classroom get above a thousand parts per million, you know that you're rebreathing other people's air. And that would mean you're also potentially rebreathing virus in that air. If we can get it down to 800, we know we've got about four air changes per hour. If we get it below 700, we know we're getting five. If we get it below 600, we know we're getting six. So it's a really great visual thing to actually know whether you've got this right. Now, if you find that you don't have it right, then put another fan in, open the door, work out how you can get it that way. Um, and if again, if it's not getting below that 800, then you need to start talking more seriously with your school about, I need fewer kids in this classroom um, because that's the way that it drops down. So um, I literally walk around. So when I'm doing um, movie sets, when we're doing those things, I walk around with a carbon dioxide meter. And if I see it get above 800, we stop filming, we put PPE on, we ventilate the space, we wait for it to drop down and then we go again. Um, it's a really great, um, visual reminder of what's actually happening in that space. The other thing that I do is, again, low tech, is I get streamers, just little cellophane. I get that and I tie it onto my Univent. I tie it onto the window unit, um, like onto the HVAC system. And I just look for air moving. And I know that air moving by itself does not necessarily mean that it's safe. It's just for me, it's a really good reminder that the Univent system is on or the HVAC system is working. Because again, if they're, they're not working and we don't have ventilation and filtration, I'm outside. I literally would take my class, I would pick them up and I would move out onto the basketball court or whatever space that you have. And I would wait for it to be working again. Um, it's not that I think that every situation is risky. Um, one of the things that, especially if you're in the south area of Rhode Island right now, your community has done the right thing in regards to community transmission. They've got it low. Um, we're looking at of a school, I know schools will be different size, uh, a school of 250 kids. Um, we are looking, working on averages, we are looking at having in a school of 250, one student per month in the school that is infected. Okay. And that may seem scary, but that is one per month, which then if you divide that up into your classrooms, there is going to be some classrooms that will never have an infected child in it based on what the community transmission is now. So we're not relying on PPE and ventilation and filtration. We're relying on the fact that they're not there. We have those other defenses, but in case someone is in there, um, we're dealing with that, but most of our classrooms will not be this state in this way. Whereas there's some classes, some schools that I've worked with in the northern part of the state where on average, every second classroom will have an infected child in it. My recommendation for there is no, it, it's just, no, that is not a risk I'm willing to personally tolerate. Um, that means we're relying almost 100% on all the protective measures, We're making sure that masks work all the time, barriers and distance work all the time. The ventilation is working all the time to keep us safe. So 
when we start thinking about risk, risk really comes from what's happening in the community that you draw from. Um, we're looking great. Like I'm in Westport, so I'm right across the border from Tiverton. Um, you know, I'm near many of your schools. Our communities have done really well by us in regards to lowering community transmission. Um, I know the one per 250 in a month may seem like, ah, but then I know that it's only one in every 10 people that are infected that infect other people. So when I start working with those risks and those numbers, um, I want to have all the mitigation we can possibly have around us, masks, distance, that I don't want to take anything from granted. But I also know that in my classroom of 15, 20, 30 kids that I have, the chances of one of them being infected because of what's coming from our community is really low right now. This conversation may change in two months, but right now we're looking pretty good. Okay, the next question from one of the teachers is, do you think it's realistic to think that teachers can stay six feet away from elementary students at yeah. all in most times? No, and I do not. So elementary, we're, you know, we're dealing with a completely different um, you know, world here, and I understand that. But I think you need to, you really do need to understand that teaching does need to change. And I will emphasize this over and over again. You might have been the best teacher in the world and you're getting 100% effective with everything that you do. How effective were you doing remote for elementary? I would say pretty terrible. I mean, it's really hard to deliver it online. Um, I watched my kids school. My kids are 11 and 13, so they did just fine. Um, but I watched some of my friends that had younger kids trying to educate their kids online. It doesn't work. So we're not even talking about being online 50% effective or 20% effective. It's just terrible. So it is okay. And I know I don't have the right to give you this permission, but it is okay not to be 100% of what you were last year. It is okay to be 80% and work differently because it needs to be that way for your health and your protection. You need to know that what you achieved last year is not realistic in today's world the way that it is. And 80% is better than 10% that it would be online, much better. So we need to keep you healthy and need to keep you safe. So that means that yes, you do need to teach more from the front of the classroom. You do need to be a little bit more standoffish in the way in which you work. But then also I do recognize that you do need to get closer to your students than say a high school teacher or a university professor. So how do we do that and do it safely? And I guess that's the million dollar question. So things that I don't want to see you do. So I coach youth soccer. I coach some very young kids, four, five, six, seven years old. Um, I always, when I'm talking to them is I don't talk to them from a standing position. I get down on my knees and I talk to them eye to eye so that we're equals when we're talking. That needs to stop. I need to talk from an elevated position. My face is now away from their face. So please don't come up to their desk, come up to their space and get down low because if you get down low, you're in their zone. And if you're in their zone, you're in that buffer that we want to have around you. So that can be done most of the time, but I realize not all of the time. So if I've got two people, the child and you wearing masks and we get a little closer together and we're face to face, it's safer, okay? Not safe, but safer. But what if that kid drops the mask? Okay, so then I like to think that if these situations are going to happen, you need to be protected and your protection is your mask, but what about your eyes right now? And this is where for elementary, for kids, people that are doing K, um, anything that would bring them close where we think mask usage might be variable, you need eye protection. Now I'm seeing, you know, on Gale, you've got great glasses on, um, nice and big. They will work just fine. Nothing's getting through. Mine are quite narrow. There's gaps around here. So they wouldn't be what I'd want for that type of protection. I mean, Andrea's, you'll look great as well. They're nice and big. That's eye protection. Mask and those provide you with protection. For those of you that don't wear glasses, think about sports glasses. Think about, um, wrap around sunglasses. I mean, you could use chemical goggles or something like that, but I like the idea of having a pair of glasses 
sitting here on top of your head. And if you need to have that interaction, not fumbling around to find them, it is they're there, you walk up, you put them down, you have your interaction, you keep it short, but you can have the interaction knowing that you've got a good quality mask on, you've got eye protection on, I'm now protected from the main form of transmission, which is droplets into my mouth, my nose and my eyes from that child. The other situation that you might encounter is a child that needs um, a little tender loving care, uh, hurt themselves, crying. How can we do this? Do not pick them up. Do not have them at your face. Okay. You can do a hip hug and hip hugs work just perfectly. Bring them in, let them hug into your hip, you know, console them, everything that you want to do, but their face is down at your hip, your face is up in fresh air. We don't have the opportunity for infection with that. The only opportunity for infection is now on my hands and I can't infect myself until I touch my face. So if I have that interaction, I need to have hand sanitizer at the end of it or wash my hands at the end of it. You can still do many of the things that you did. You just need to think of them from an infection control standpoint. I don't want to be near their face. If I have to be near their face, I want to be protected. I'm now protected. If I need to provide closer comfort to them, I need to keep my face away, do it on my hip, but I now need to wash my hands. So uh, that's about the best I can come up with. Change the way that you work and think about the situation that you get in. The last thing you want to do is have your face at the same level as theirs and be close. Thank you very much for that, especially the part I know a lot of our teachers are putting a lot of pressure on themselves to teach in the way they used to before. And just being hearing that it's not going to be the same. And no one, I will just share from, I believe a lot of the superintendents feel the same. We know that and we're here to support them. The next question is, we are told students cannot take mask breaks in our classrooms, even if they are six feet apart. But the plan is in our school to have them eat snack and lunch in our classrooms. Okay. So again, I don't set policy, but I can tell you what is safe, safe, uh, not safe. Um, so the, a person speaking puts out 75 times more respiratory droplets and aerosols than a person that is quiet. A person that is speaking with a mask on puts out more aerosols than a person with the mask off sitting there quiet. Okay. So if I use that information, I can say that if I can keep my classroom quiet and I can create distance, then can a mask come off and not be safe? I mean, there's safe is mask on, but still work in that safer type area. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so some schools that have allowed it um, have said, and this is what we've developed with my kids' school, with Westport, with a few of the schools around here, is uh, for five minutes out of every hour, um, the students can take the masks off and it's quiet reading time, um, whatever they want to do with that, and just quiet. I realize that may be an impossible, fictitious dream in a first grade classroom, but a, a quiet classroom is a safe classroom. Um, and that's the same for eating. That's the same for taking mask breaks. Um, if they're eating at their desk, it needs to be quiet. Um, the louder a person speaks, the more they put out. Shouting puts out more and more again. So somebody just, hey teacher, and whispering is not doing as much as somebody that's talking at the level I am at. But you've got to, to put that in context. So. Um, Things that I've done in school districts that allow it, in states that allow it, is building in a mask timeout, a quiet timeout, um, every hour for five minutes. Some are doing that just before they transition to different classes. Others where they're placed in the classroom time are just building in these breaks as part of what they do. The other thing that we've done in classrooms that can physically accommodate this is create a break space. So if you can design your classroom and bump all the chairs and tables back further and create a six, preferably 10 foot buffer at the front of the classroom between like the teacher, the chalkboard, um, an area up there, 
in the front of the classroom, you can actually mark out an eight foot by eight foot box. And what you can do and set up in there is that a child that is masked can walk up to that box, can stand in the very far corner of that box, take their mask off, take a drink of water, put their water down, put their mask back on and move back to their chair. Um, teachers, it's exactly the same thing. You don't take a drink at your bench. You stand up and you walk into that space. You model the behavior that you want to see. And again, if they're not talking, you're not a risk. The reason I want eight feet, preferably 10, is if you take a drink and you cough, we don't want that spraying out. So we need to have that distance away. Now in classrooms that don't have that space to create, if you have a doorway and you have a hallway and you don't have lots of people moving up in the hallway, you can create that box just straight outside the door. Again, a table out there with people's drink bottles on or at their own bench with it. They walk out, they stand at the door, they take their mask off, they have a drink, they put it back on and they come back in. The only time I wouldn't do that is if there's a lot of activity up and down the hallway or if two classroom doors are side by side each other. Um, I don't want two students standing out there and then a conversation starting because they're right next to each other, like three, four feet away. So you've got to know your students, um, whether you can do this or not. It comes down to your risk tolerance and those things. But a quiet student with the mask off for a few minutes does not present a great risk to the classroom. Um, I think if students can't be quiet with it. You put the masks back on them and you tell them to put it back on. It just depends on what sort of not control you have in the classroom. It's not up to you whether you've got troublemakers in there, but if you know your classroom can handle it and your school allows, I think five minute breaks every hour can and should be built into the day. Thank you. Um, what is your opinion regarding the safety of singing while wearing a cloth mask? Yeah, so if you would have asked me that a month or so ago, I would say just there's no way that you can sing with a mask on indoors safely. Um, we just know that some of the biggest outbreaks in the world have actually come from choruses and choirs. Um, but we do know singing puts out an enormous amount of respiratory droplets. Um, and if that person is infected, they can infect a lot of others. But where we have seen these infections, it's been in poorly ventilated spaces. So um, I, I still do caution away from singing indoors, even with masks on, because it's a little bit of an unknown. Um, but if I can get into a well-ventilated space, better than the four, better than the six, um, and I can get a good quality mask on those people, um, then I think there is a way to do this safer um, given some of the new data that's coming out. It's showing that people singing with a mask on um, does not put out, like puts out about the same amount as shouting, like not shouting, but talking loudly with a mask on. And so it really does drop that, that risk down. The safest place for singing is still outdoors with the wind in everybody's face in a line, letting everything that they sing and project go back over their shoulder, separate them out by six feet, um, let them belt at their heart's content and enjoy that outside. Um, I think you really need to think about music singing indoors very carefully, um, whether it is worth that risk given the constraints that you have on um, the physical infrastructure and the quality of mask that people are wearing. Um, I do think about like, if you have a classroom with windows across the side, putting fans behind each one of them and masks on and just let the air suck out behind them. Uh, like, yeah, you could do that, but you need to really think about how you engineer the space to do that. But in a, a regular classroom that's poorly ventilated, I haven't, I, my comfort level is not quite there. Hum, do something else that doesn't involve the mouth being wide open and belting it out. Um, the louder you sing, the more dangerous it becomes. So whatever we can do to lower volume and increase air, um, we can. And I'm sorry for all the music teachers out there. And, uh, you know, I'm having this problem with the Boston Lyric Opera. We're having this problem, obviously, with, um, you know, film and television. It, it, is, it is worrying. 
Okay. Do you rec? All right. And I'm uh, Dr. Kenworthy. I'm going to check in with you in the chat. We're about halfway through with the questions submitted by teachers. Do you have anything to share from the chat room? Sure. A number of questions in here. Uh, some of which have already been addressed, but maybe we can um, you know, go through a couple of these. Uh, so I'm seeing one that hasn't been addressed. If we have stable pods and everyone wears masks. How do you feel, Dr. Ramaj, about less than six foot distance between students? Yeah, so um, how do I feel? Um, it, it, it depends ventilation and those type of things, but I understand that that is going to be the case in many of our schools. Um, the CDC wavered on this, like there really is no scientific justification for six feet and masks. And I know I'm going against what the CDC says. They're just keeping the messaging very clear. You need six feet and you need masks. And I've seen the, the Facebook memes, if masks work, why the six feet? If six feet works, why the masks? Well, the reason that is it's two layers of defense. If one fails, the other one is there. So can you always keep six feet away or will, will interactions happen? Um, well, you know, unless you're putting chairs and no one moves their chairs and they don't stand up and move, interactions are going to occur under six feet. So we really want to have two layers of defense wherever we can for every mode of transmission. But three feet is okay. Four feet is better. Five feet is better. Six feet is best. 10 feet is perfect. I mean, it, we're working in a scale. There's not a cutoff with this. So if, I am in, if I'm working in a classroom where mask compliance is variable because of age or the type of student that I'm working with, I would prefer more distance. Um, and if I can't get distance between students, distance between me and the students. Um, remember that I know you're all worried about your own children, as in your kids that are in your classroom. Um, I'm not diminishing your talents, but you are not infection control specialists. If those that are making the decisions decide to put it at three feet, you can't control that. All you can control is your interactions that you have in keeping yourself safe. Um, I know we have our students' best interest at mind, but you know, from a practical standpoint, I need to keep you safe and you need to be safe with this. So you need to guard your interactions. But when I walk into a class and I see six feet space distance, I feel comfortable. I've walked into classrooms where I've seen three feet of space and I felt very uncomfortable. Um, now I felt more uncomfortable in communities with high transmission rates than what I did in the past. Three feet gives you the ability for students not to touch each other and share and grab things off benches. So we take care of the direct transmission risk. Um, they do still do put people at the risk for dropping the mask and having a conversation and landing in the eyes of the other child. Um, I think it also needs to be something that's scalable. Um, if you can obviously set it up with great distance at the start and accommodate all your kids, great. If we're looking at that risk of one child per month out of a 250 you know, child classroom, then probably four or five feet will be just fine. Um, I will come back to something. I haven't actually said it, but I will highlight this. The person that puts the classroom at the biggest risk is the biggest talker. Okay. So if your classroom is you talking, guess who the biggest risk to the classroom is? It's you. Okay. Um, and so this is why, again, I will come back and say that we need to protect you. The way that we look at infections in schools is not a child coming in and infecting all the other children. Um, that happens, but it's been really rare in the world's sort of data that we have with this. What is more likely to happen is a child is infected, a teacher works with them closely without the barriers that I've told you about, the teacher then gets infected. The teacher then talks from the front of the, like then does the job the normal way they do, interacting with all the other students and infects the other students, okay? So when we're looking out after kids' safety in the classroom, 
it really does come down to you and your safety because again, the person who's doing the most talking, the person that is the most mobile, the person that's having the most interactions is the person that is most likely to transmit an infection in any given place. So I would like, go back to your question, I would like further distance if we can. Um, would I want to be in a three feet space classroom if I was in um, an area that had a high transmission rate? No. Would I prefer to be in a six foot distance classroom anywhere? Yes. But would I accept five and four? Yes, as long as the transmission data suggests. If you find that your community is getting up to 5% positivity and 75 cases per 100,000 you know, every week, like get to these metrics, then you should look at de-densifying your classrooms, making more space between it and having few students there. But at the moment, if we can get four or five or six feet um, in most of our places, we look pretty good in putting them together and not really having the, the worry of an infection coming in. Okay. Uh, there's a question about offices or small areas, uh, I assume used by adults, without windows or vents and, and strategies that can be taken to mitigate these areas. Yeah, so I would not share an office space with anybody else right now um, without there being some sort of defense in there. Um, first and foremost, masks, and then I need ventilation or filtration. So in shared offices without ventilation or filtration, you either make them non-shared offices, um, one person at a time, a gap in time between the people coming in, um, or you put filtration into that space, um, be it a portable air filter, you know, a small office, you know, a, a 10 by 10 or a 15 by 15 foot space, um, a 200, $250 HEPA filter will keep that air just the way that you want it. A larger space, it's more of a three or $400 one. Um, but shared office spaces, again, because it's more likely that infections are going to go from adult to adult. Um, you know, when I look at one of the biggest outbreaks in Australia, um, so they did great. They had 10 cases per day in Australia for months in the entire country. And then we had an outbreak at a meat packing facility. That person went home, infected their household unit. Their child then went to school and it was a big school. It was a 2000 kids school. Um, no protections at all. You know, there's no masks being worn. There's no distance. There's no anything happening in Australia. So that child infected the teacher. The teacher then infected three other teachers and eight staff members. Each of those teachers and staff members then infected their classrooms, then infected their household units, and it went from there out. There was no evidence of student to student. It was teacher to staff member to teacher to teacher and then hit the classrooms. So when I say that we need to look after you, we need to look after you because you are important for the teaching, but you're also the ones that are at risk. So should teachers still be meeting the same way as they did outside of their pods to design curriculum? No, um, you need to design ways for that to happen. As an example, um, what we set up in my, my kids school is the library is not going to be used as often. It's going to be used for one grade pod per day. But that means that the library is accessible for a lot more hours outside of the day. And I know two teachers need to meet, maybe to have lunch, but maybe to talk about curriculum. So we got an eight foot long bench. We put a teacher at one end, a chair at one end, a teacher at the other end, and that we knew we had good ventilation in that space. And that was the interaction that they had. We designed it the way that we wanted to have it to make sure that an infection couldn't transmit from pod to pod. So. Um, you need to be mindful of those interactions you have outside of the classroom because, again, teachers, adults um, are more likely to be the ones that transmit to students than student to student. So, so as a follow-up to that, there was a, another question about should, should adults be congregating in one area for, for planning or lunch? It's, it sounds like that's what you were addressing there. Yeah, so... When I think of congregations, I'm like, nope, 
nope, nope, nope, but design them the way that you want them. Um, and the way that we want them is six feet of distance because again, we're not just thinking about transmission, we're also thinking about contact tracing. If you, even if you were 100% protected and you worked on that teacher's shoulder for 20 minutes, guess what? You are now caught in their contact tracing web if one of them tests positive. So again, when we want to design our workflows, our systems at schools, in businesses, it doesn't matter where it is, is you want to make sure that you don't get caught in the web of infection, but also the web of contact tracing. So if you need to have all of your third grade teachers get together to design, you know, unified curriculum, can we do it? Yes. Where should we do it? Outside. If we can't do it outside, where should we do it? Set up a conference table area that is well ventilated or well filtered. Take out every chair out of that space that you are not going to use that you can't separate by six feet and set them six feet apart and working around a big bench together. That way, we know from an infection control standpoint, we have masks, we have distance, and we have filtration. That's great. We now have six feet of space between them. So if one of those teachers' pods becomes infected or one of those teachers is infected, those other three or four teachers that work with them are not caught up in the web of contact tracing. They know they are safe because we had the distance, we had the space, we had the PPE, and now we don't have to worry about the flow on impact to the rest of our school. Design safe interactions from an infection control standpoint, but also a contact tracing standpoint. How about, um, is it safe for students to be eating breakfast or lunch in the classroom? Obviously masks would be off. I know it's, it's probably part of most of our plans, especially at the lower grades for students to be eating in the classroom. Yeah, so everything's a trade-off. If we get the kids and stand them up and move them somewhere, there's more interactions, there's more interactions with other pods, more surfaces they can touch. If we have them eat in the classroom, that means we're in a smaller space with masks off and we've got a risk. Everything is trade-offs. Um, lunch in a classroom where you can keep them quiet is relatively safe. Um, it does add more droplets into the air than, not having, than having a mask on. Um, but a good, again, a well-ventilated space is just fine. If we can't stop the conversations, then it does become more risky and we really need to think about how we're actually doing this. Um, I tend to think that if, I can't imagine a whole classroom not listening to the instructions of being quiet and eating. There may be certain children that are unable for various reasons to control themselves. I will put my son in that category, he can't shut up. Um, is then I would actually have a portable barrier um, you can see these little barriers that uh, they're made out of plastic. They, you've seen them on kids' benches where they sort of form a U-shape around them. Um, and you can just pick them up and move them. Um, I would stick a barrier right around them and just not behind them, but just around them. And they're eating inside their space. So if they talk, any droplets just hit that barrier and don't land on the kids that are around them. Um, I always want two layers of defense. So I've got to have that barrier if I don't have distance and those type of things. So um, I don't think that is a plan that applies to everybody, but in certain circumstances, it may be a requirement that a child that cannot keep quiet while eating needs to have a barrier around them or needs to be further away from the others. Um, I think about the same thing. There's going to be some kids that will not wear masks due to um, medical reasons. Um, so what do I do with them? Well, I don't put them in the middle of the classroom. I put them closest to the window as possible. Um, I have them near the exhaust vent of the fan that I've got going out and I put extra distance between them. And I'm sorry if that makes them more isolated than everybody else, but they present a risk to the classroom. So I need to minimize that risk by creating extra distance and extra ventilation around them. And I mean, that's just the way it needs to be. Uh, kind of a follow up to that. Uh, this is another question about plexiglass dividers. Can you address the value of plexiglass dividers? Okay, I, I absolutely hate plexiglass. I hate any dividers that go up because if we're working on the primary barrier, which is the mask, we've already got plexiglass on our face. 
Um, and if we're working on ventilation, guess what plexiglass does? Messes around with the ventilation. It creates dead pockets and spaces where the air doesn't move. Um, the only places I want plexiglass is where um, mask use may be variable and I don't have, I don't have that other barrier and I'm talking glasses, that's plexiglass on your face. A face shield is plexiglass on your face. Um, so where I think about these things, where do we need plexi? Uh, at the front entrance to a school, there is more likely to have variable mask usage coming into the school. A parent that is just being a parent and being a pain, maybe a anti-masker, um, you know, I need to protect that person there to do that. I don't see it being a value at a teacher's table um, because I would rather a teacher travel with the plexiglass on their face. So glasses or, um, you know, goggles with that. Um, I see plexiglass being really important for speech therapy. Um, so speech therapy, I set up a desk. I can't have distance and I can't have a mask. So I need to have a defense. So I put a desk there. I put plexiglass between us. I have a filter or I have aeration, like ventilation right beside me, drawing it out. And then I can get three, two, three feet away from them, knowing that nothing that they can do with their droplets can hit my face at all. So both of us can have masks off. So they can see my lips that you can see their lips. Um, they can have masks off. And I know I'm dealing with the aerosol risk by filtration or ventilation, sucking it right out beside me. So there are very specific places where we need to have it, um, but it should be used sparingly because it messes around with the ventilation. Um, and it, it's just, it's not the best strategy. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jameen, did you have other questions or you want me to keep going? I uh, know we do have some other questions that teachers did submit. Okay. So let me um, go back. Um, if airflow from a vent barely moves strips of paper taped in front of it, does that indicate there is an adequate exchange of air in four hour time frame? I think you may have addressed some of that already. But yeah, I mean, that was one really, of the questions. A really weak flow. Um, in a large space would suggest, you know, Houston, we have a problem. Um, so, you know, that's where, you know, we can jump up and down, but I guarantee if your schools tried to get an HVAC assessment now, they're not going to be able to get one in time. So this is where for a hundred, $200, um, get a CO2 monitor in your school and do assessments of the rooms. Um, literally stick it in the middle of the room away from the ventilation, away from people breathing on it and see what actually happens. And again, we've got a little bit of time to get this right um, because again, infection rates are really low. But if you find that it's regularly going above that 800 parts per million, then start beating your chest and banging the drum and saying that this is not safe. Um, that's again, open windows, do those type of things. So um, you can't say definitively that a weak flow is not giving you what you need, um, but it, it's fairly suggestive of that, um, that it's not giving you what you need. Should K9, KN95 masks be worn without a surgical mask over it if N95 are not available? So I am not a fan of really anybody being in KN95s or N95s. Um, I don't have one here. Um, so when I'm getting fitted for a, an N95 at work, just so that you understand what happens, um, I put a mask on, I get it fitted so it's nice and tight and comfortable. They then put a hood over my head. Um, so it's an air seal over my head. And then they will spray salt, you know, so salt water or a perfume or a foul tasting smell into that hood. If I can taste it or smell it, it's not working, okay? And so then we take it off, I try a different brand and I keep going and I keep going and I keep going until we get one that fits. So size and things, it, it takes a long time and it takes specialized training to get a KN95 or an N95 to fit properly to provide the protection that it needs. And we use KN95s or N95s not to present, protect us against the droplets, a handkerchief will do that. We use that to protect ourselves against aerosols. 
and aerosols, remember I said they come in through the side of the mask. So if you don't have it fit so that perfume can come in or you can taste something in the air, aerosols can get in. So you've just spent a lot of money on a false sense of security. So I am not a big fan of KN95s unless you know they fit well. Do they collapse every time that you breathe in them? And you've got a reason that you need to wear them such as um, you may be recovering from cancer or you are in that highly susceptible um, age, you know, in not age or you know, comorbidity group, or you have somebody at home like that. But even then, I'm not necessarily a big fan of them because of how difficult they are to fit. I always, I am always resorting back to these. Um, I tried every mask under the sun, and I'm not joking when I spent, say, I spent nearly a thousand dollars on masks over the past six months trying different ones, trying to find one to teach in that I can talk in effectively. And I always come back to surgical masks. So a type three surgical mask, you can buy a box from Amazon for about $40 right now. There's 50 of them in there. You could use them easily for a week each. Um, these are five ply. They not only catch 100% of the droplets, they will block somewhere in the vicinity of 80 to 90% of all aerosols. And they're really easy to fit. You put them on, you bend them around your nose, you stick them around your ears and then puff them out and you'll see the air coming in and out with those. So if you want to go to a KN or an N95, sure, but realize that that's not giving you the level of protection you really think they are. Um, I would invest if I would invest in surgical masks, uh, either type one or type three, um, depending on what you can get and have available. Will cloth masks work for most people? Yes. If I'm a higher risk, yes. If I'm a higher interaction person, then I might go to a higher mask. So for me, going to courtrooms and going to these different places, I have a lot of interactions. I need to keep myself safer so that I'm not a big part of the problem. I wear these masks. Okay. All right. So we have about five minutes left. I do have quite a few more questions. I'd say at least eight or 10. Um, we have, if students are facing forward in line in the hall, is it necessary to stay six feet apart? Yeah. The only real thing I want you to jump on your students about is mask use. That is your biggest protection that you can have with this. If kids get within three feet of each other for a brief you know, time, a few minutes, it doesn't matter. Okay, mask use, mask use, mask use, mask use is if you're going to enforce one thing and rigorously, it's wearing masks. So brief close contact interactions, I'm not worried about. Three feet away from each other, back to back where we're walking or going somewhere, I'm not worried about. Three feet away from each other, standing there for half an hour, eh, yeah, let's not do that. Uh, hallways are not as well ventilated as classrooms should be. So I don't want to do that. So if we're lining up to go somewhere, three feet is just fine. It's mask use that you need to work on. Even better if they're all facing the one direction, because if a mask fails, it's getting sprayed in the back of the head. So I I'm not too concerned. Focus on mask use. Focus on paint pointing forward. Don't focus so much on space because you're going to waste anxiety and energy on something that is a really low risk behavior. Focus on the big things. And should it be, uh, following up on the hallways, should fans be placed in the hallways to keep the air circulating? Not if it's just a fan without ventilation. Um, I think that if you set up the classrooms the way that I said, so one school um, put all their fans into the classrooms facing out and they opened windows up high on their gym that was central to all the classrooms and that's where the air came in. Um, another school actually took out two window panes and put in louvers so they still had security. That's how they came in because we can't open the front doors in some schools because of safety. Um, if we do that, our hallways are ventilated. We don't need fans. And for the last question today, how do you feel about parental attestation to return to school? Parents filling out those COVID checklists for students. Oh, we can't, we can't rely on them at all. I mean, if, okay. a, if a parent wants to send their kid who has a fever, they're going to give them ibuprofen, right? I mean, we all know it's going to happen. Um, it's just a, if it catches a few, 
Great. Um, it's the same with temperature monitoring. Um, temperature monitoring will capture less than 10% of kids coming into our school that are have an infection. So let's not waste time and effort on pandemic theater, um, things that we're spending a lot of time and effort monitoring um, for things that aren't really effective. Just assume, and I mean, I know it's hard, but just assume that there's someone in your classroom that is infected, even though there's likely not. Just assume there is and model your behavior like there is somebody there. Um, yes, for security purposes, for you know what the school needs to do, yeah, let them deal with that, the monitoring before there. But let's let's be honest. Um, we know that there are people in this community that are really just more worried about sending their kids to school than anybody else's health. Um, if they want to lie on that form, they're going to do it. Um, and so should we be relying on that? No. Do we need to do it? Yeah. Every business I'm working with does them. I, I just, I, I don't think that they're overly useful. Okay. Right. I believe, I don't know if I'm muted. I see mute. Um, but I, Dr. Bramage, um, thank you very much. Um, we tried to get to all the questions. We have about six more left, but we will try to follow up in some way, shape or form. Yeah. I'm going to hand it back to our host, uh, Dr. Kenworthy, Tom. And again, thank you very much for being You're here welcome. today. And yeah, I'll time. just jump in for a tick. Any question that we didn't get to or that you still have lingering, can you get them centralized and get them to me? Absolutely. I'm hoping by tomorrow I can have up on my website and I'll send you the link, just a huge question and answer of all the ones that I've answered over time. Um, there for teachers just to have as a resource to come to. So I'll be able to answer them. You'll get an answer or just be in written form. So if you can do that, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. And on behalf of all the East Bay superintendents, thank you very much again for helping us in this collaborative effort. And now I'm swinging it over to Dr. Kenworthy. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you to Dr. Ramaj. Um, just a reminder that this session was also recorded on our Portsmouth YouTube live channel. I'll resend uh, that link to all the superintendents so that everybody has that as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Have a nice afternoon. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Everyone have a great day. You sure. too. Thank you.